can get started. Okay. Yes. Sure. So because this is a um, an NEA sponsored program, I do just want to say um, this is a National Endowments of the Arts sponsored program. They helped get us the books and all of the resources and everything involved there. So just a big thank you to them for sponsoring us and um, bringing this book to us. Yeah. And with that out of the way, um, <laughs> what did everyone think of Station Eleven? To, to, to answer your question, what we thought about Station Eleven? Yeah. <laughs> I thought to myself, oh my goodness, is this about a pandemic? <laughs> when I started reading it, you know, oh no, <laughs> I don't know if I need this right now. Yeah, I didn't think it was a great book to read during a pandemic, to be honest with you. <laughs> it just scares you more. I mean, it's just kind of, um, it jumped around a lot, but then finally tied everything up towards the end. So, you know, a little harder to follow, but I mean, it wasn't a bad book, but I wouldn't put it up there on my list of favorites but anyway that's, that's interesting because i thought that it was a particularly good book because it jumped around <laughs> and because she brought in so many different elements but that first chapter was just kind of key where she set the, basically set the stage for the whole book and um she kept jumping around, but she kept going back and painting more fully each character that she wanted to focus on. And um, I thought that was part of the interest in this gal as a writer, uh, the way she set everything up. And I wasn't thrilled with the subject of the pandemic, but she's just come out with another new book called The Glass House, I think. and. Uh, it's easily confused with The Glass Castle, which was another book that we read recent, a couple of years ago. But I'd be very curious to know the subject of the new book and how she handles that. And um, this was up for a National Book Award. So a lot of people thought it was very interesting, but you really have to read it more carefully than a lot of the books that are just out there and you know you just browse right through and you have a great time reading and then you forget totally what it was about when you're through <laughs> and this one may stay with me uh, a little bit longer so i think you have to be a fan of science fiction and i really never have <clears throat> been a fan no of i never have been either so <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't about the science fiction it was about the individual character development more well me. yeah i enjoyed the characters but yeah it was yeah like I said, it was okay. It's great about the book, whether it's science fiction or not. The author herself doesn't want it categorized as sci-fi. Really? Yeah. Okay. I don't forget she wrote it in 2014, I think. So before this. Pandemic. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. This pandemic. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't call it science fiction. Uh, I mean, it's dystopian, but there have been a lot of very well-known authors that have been writing sort of dystopian uh, novels. So I, I wouldn't call it science fiction. And I actually found it, I almost didn't read it when I got started because it really traumatized me in a sense. It's like, we're in this. This could be the worst case scenario. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, I think it was. <laughs> You know, but the difference is that we have tools that can be used and people were aware of it before it got to that point and vaccines have been developed that hopefully show a lot of promise. So we'll see where it goes. But um, so far, everything hasn't been immobilized. <laughs> Another comment about her as an author, um, I was reading that she did not want to be characterized as a science fiction writer, but she also wrote two previous books that were crime novels, and she doesn't want to be characterized as a crime novelist either. So I want to know more about her, and it was harder to find out, and I haven't had a real chance to look up a lot of her background, but I find 
the writing that she does very interesting and I would like to know more about where she's coming from and how she happens to do the things she does. As I read an interview with her in which she said that um, she considered it a love letter to the extraordinary world that we live in. Really? And that mm -hmm. <laughs> I thought that was just so beautiful. <laughs> Yeah. Changed yeah. Interesting. Much for me. She is going to be um, participating in a Zoom meeting uh, towards the end of the program. And we're asking people to submit questions for her as well. So, Gloria, if there's something you really want to hear from her about, be sure and go on the website and put something in there. Sounds great. Does anybody else have opinions? Was I the only one? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody else is talking. <laughs> Not at all. I liked it. I liked it better than I thought I would. Um, I thought it was interesting that that at the very beginning, she got sort of the reaction of people. Right, you know, they were going out and clearing out the grocery store shelves, and um, the the guy's friend who got the call at the very beginning and his friend was saying you better get out of the city you know that's something else people did so many people have come up here to, to spend the time hey, Peggy. Um, <laughs> the hi Peggy <laughs> the um there were sort of it was sort of a large cast of characters and at first it was hard to remember. I think now, I know this person has been mentioned before. How do they fit in? And I'd have to turn back and read a few things. But after a while, you got to know them and it wasn't so, so much of a problem. Um, Mary, I, mm -hmm. I just got the schedule and that author talk is on Thursday, February 11th at 7 p.m. And I believe there's another meeting, um, either just before or just after, with the uh, gentleman who adapted the book for the um, HBO series. Oh. So they're going to do a talk about that as well. If, if you haven't heard, it's going to be it's going to be on HBO, so we can all watch this. <laughs> it hasn't appeared <laughs> yet. It's, no, <laughs> going to be no, right later this year. Later this year. Mm -hmm. I've been following how our pandemic is um, impacting the mental health of our children and our young adults. And so when I was following the prophet through this book and you learned that he was the little boy that was in the airport with his mother, um, I found that kind of interesting. I mean, he obviously was very traumatized and, and didn't come out of that um, with such healthy mental health. Um, <laughs> and I think another uh, a thing about her as a writer, good news is, is that when you were reading, at least for me, I felt like I was really right there. The bad news is, is that I think mm -hmm. that's what made it so frightening sometimes. I mean, this was a book that I literally consciously chose not to read a chapter or two of before I went to bed at night. Um, because it, you know, it was it was that but there was a statement in here that said the world has become so local and that was something else that rang true for me I think that that's how it's become just living up in door county it's become so local we don't have you know the winter concert series at the white gull where other people are coming in from around the united states and um for for obvious health reasons we've become very local so there were times that it was comfortable to kind of compare where we're at now with what was going on in the book and other times where it was concerning. You know, I do, I, I am concerned about the mental health of our youth going through this. Um, so that's my thought on it. Hmm. Joan, you had your hand up a couple of times. Yeah, I thought the writing was just beautiful. I think she's I've never read anything by her before. I thought she was a fabulous storyteller, even though I was very uncomfortable with the story because it felt too close to home. But I, I 
that's really what kept me going. It was beautifully written and the characters I thought were well-developed. I, so that was mm -hmm. all a very good thing. I, I do I've love not, the writing too. I've mm -hmm. not read any dystopian fiction before this other than, I guess, 1994 and 80, Our, whatever, the Orwell book and, um, and then Fahrenheit. But this, this made it um, more personal. You really got to know these characters and care about what happened to them. Mm -hmm. oh, I like There's that. a list of discussion questions that the library put out. And one of them that I thought was interesting was whether or not the book has a main character. And if so, who is it? <laughs> Well, I think Arthur is the one that all of the other events kind of cluster around, hang around in a in a one sense, but I'm not sure it has a, a main character. It's almost like an ensemble or a troop of, of people um, who keep disappearing and appearing in different contexts throughout the book. And uh, I thought she was very skillful at doing that. And uh, I read the first chapter not paying a tremendous amount of attention, of attention, just breezing through it and thinking, oh, this is good. It, I don't see why it's characterized as science fiction. And then after that, with the um, Jeever going to the supermarket and filling up the carts and the phone call from uh, his friend, and uh, it turned into something totally different, but... Um, I think it, in general, may fit the fantasy, certainly fantasy. It's a work of imagination at the time she wrote it. But um, science fiction didn't really seem to fit at first to me, but I can see why it would be categorized. But I think it's broader than that in a lot of ways. Well, like you said, dystopian, maybe. Peggy? Dystopian, well, definitely. <laughs> Arthur, Arthur was me. sort of the catalyst, but it was Kirsten who really was the main character all the way through from the yeah. beginning. Mm -hmm. of that. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> Gloria, you brought up um, chapter three where Jeevan is in the grocery store. Yes. Buying up multiple carts of supplies. Did that... Um, I read the book a couple of years ago. So this spring, that chapter haunted me anytime I went into a grocery store. <laughs> but if, did anyone have a strong reaction to this? Because I don't think I'll forget that chapter anytime soon. It, it has stuck with me. <laughs> I, I had to kind of laugh, chuckle at that because I lived in Florida for 37 years. And you may know that we have terrible storms there and I learned to always have six gallons of water on hand because you perhaps wouldn't be able to drink yours and uh, staples so I, I had a big pantry of stuff I did use it of course you know you would use one thing of peanut butter and buy another one but if we heard that there was a storm coming I, I certainly did go to the store but I didn't have to go to the extent of having five or six carts like he did because I already had a stash. And this story was different because it wasn't, oh boy, just another hurricane, which is how we felt about it. You know, we're going to be in for three or four days. We hope the roof doesn't fall off, which it did when I was. <laughs> But you know, you just kind of get used to things if they happen a lot. And this was a once in a lifetime occurrence, at least in the way the book started to be presented. So it, you can see that the way they reacted to it would be so much different than how I learned to react to the coming of a new hurricane. It was just a funny thing for me to see him behaving that way, but everybody else in the store wasn't buying things like crazy. So everybody- He, he was the only one that gave an early warning. So he was the only one. 
Right. And that pandemic moves so fast. I mean, it was in the book. It was just very fast moving. Nobody very knows. fast and very deadly. Right. <laughs> and I, I thought the beginning of the book, it was so fascinating and it did move so fast. And it wasn't until I got to chapter six. Chapter six is what she calls the incomplete list of no more this, no more that. That it really struck me, and that that was just beautifully written. No more pharmaceuticals, no more flight, no more towns, blends from the sky. It's only two page, a page and a quarter long, but it it really um, it went whoa. Now, just think about what this means. Yes. Well, there are a couple of instances, like for instance, when they were at the airport and a pilot decided to take a plane that was fueled and just go for it, go to California, see what was going on there. The, the lights of that um, city in the distance that the um, traveling symphony set off for, uh, the, the ships that were at anchor outside of Miranda, Miranda's, wherever she was in Miramar, wherever she was, that just made my heart sore. <laughs> just thought the possibility. And sometimes starting over again isn't the worst idea for humanity. <laughs> you know? The most recent George Clooney movie, I can't remember the name of it now, is all about that too, is that <clears throat> Earth destroys itself and it's about spacecraft astronauts that were sent to explore to Mars coming back to Earth that has been totally destroyed by a pandemic or a war. They never really tell you which, but same kind of message. Yeah. <clears throat> well, going go back to the start of the pandemic, I'm sorry, am I interrupting? No, go ahead, right. uh, Going back to the start of the pandemic, we were in Arizona in <coughs> March and we headed home just before the university started back up again because we figured there'd be much more opportunity to spread things. But my daughter kept calling me and telling me how different things were disappearing from the grocery shelves mm -hmm. and um, supplies were running out of a lot of different things in Arizona, much on a much larger scale and much more so than uh, here in Wisconsin, I mean, there was some of it to, in, in every place, but not like it sounded as though it were happening there. So going back to the beginning of the, um, the book where Jeeva's supplying and, you know, getting carts of things, um, it happened to some extent. I think everything uh, that they show, that she shows in the book, a lot of the things have been, um, we've seen as part of the pandemic, but not in the uh, fullest or most exaggerated sense of the book. The book is like, if there's a total shutdown, if there's a total, uh, uh, everybody that gets it dies kind of thing. And um, it's, it's got a lot of impact right now. And I'm sure that was part of the reason it was chosen as the big read this year. <laughs> If I can defend us a little bit, uh, sure. this was chosen before the uh, before the pandemic. Really, oh, wow. so <laughs> for anyone who this triggered, we understand it, it was chosen long ago, and so, and they kept it. <laughs> we kept it despite well, the pandemic. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think at that point, all of the resources had gone to it, and you know, this year has just been so topsy turvy. I don't. Yeah. You know, throughout the year, I think we were all thinking, are we even going to have a program and what's it going to look like? And right. so it was an unusual choice. I, I don't know whether they would have chosen it if they'd known um, what was coming. But right. it had been a choice, um, <laughs> as was Fahrenheit 11, of the big read, which is the national program, mm -hmm. not Door County read which yep. is our program. We started out with the big read. Remember, we had play readings that some of us were in and- uh, This is actually the first year in about 10 where we are back with the big read. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But this was the big read 
not not this year. It was the big read before beforehand. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So interesting. How what did everybody think about the character of Clark? You know, the, he was uh, the head of the Museum of Civilization, but he had been introduced way at the beginning of the story. And then it sort of ended up with him being kind of the, the keeper of, of all, all their past at the airport. Mm -hmm. I thought he was an interesting character. I absolutely fell in love with him. I loved his character. <laughs> he was charming and kind and I, I really enjoyed the sections where we got to know him more. Uh -huh. Thought he had a great sense of humor. His job is fascinating, or his job prior to the museum was fascinating to me. Um, yeah, I, I enjoyed him quite a bit. I, um, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> I was just to say it was interesting that they chose an airport to uh, camp out in and how lucky it was a brand new airport. And I love the parties they threw early on when they raided Fresh. Chili's or <laughs> one of the other chains that had a, had a kiosk there and, and had big parties and sent people out to shoot deer in the woods. <laughs> I just thought it was just a wonderful feeling of community and survival. Right. That was great. But then you would all of a sudden remember the airplane that was parked at the far end of the runways mm -hmm. that had never been opened. Ooh, yeah. yes. It's just, I, ugh. That was one of the scariest parts for me. Mm -hmm. Just came back to haunt you every now and then and terrify you. Maybe in some ways she chose an airport uh, and a new one because it replicated a little bit of a city with lots of space and lots of different areas for people to do different things and for her as an author to explore different kinds of things. Um, but to go back to uh, Clark, I think the one, and, and to Mary's comment about the, um, what she's going to remember about the book I am going to remember a crazy little detail, and that was Clark shaving his head again. <laughs> and uh, in the end, she fl fleshes that out more with one side of it being pink when he was a younger person. But it just cracked me up that she would think of that kind of a detail to include. And she really does get to a lot of details about a lot of different things. So well, he, anyway. he had seemed like such a you know, basically sane person yeah. through the whole thing. And then to have this crazy haircut, it just like there was another side to him <laughs> that wasn't so serious. And, um, and he made that pact with a friend at the airport saying, if you see me going a little crazy or I see you going a little crazy, let's tell each other. <laughs> so he did that, he raised an eyebrow, but was sort of like, okay, <clears throat> well, not crazy yet, but this is unusual. I think it would be interesting to know what uh, passage of the book was memorable for each one of us, like Gloria's head shaving. For me, it was going into the house that I think it was uh, Kristen and another um, player from the theater uh, going into a house that had never been um, raided. Mm -hmm. It was a pristine house and for her picking up that dress and picking up a carton of salt and mm -hmm. just kind of being reverent about the fact that it hadn't been raided. I keep, I just, I guess I kept wondering why the people who survived survived if it was such a radical, fast, deadly, you know, pandemic, why did they all of a sudden decide, mm -hmm. you know, survive? I just, it didn't really explain why they were able to survive? Was their genes different? Were they were in a projected pl I mean, I kept searching for that and it kind of left me hanging, which kind of annoyed me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, did anybody else catch any explanation about why th those particular people survived when the whole earth got, you know? <laughs> I mean, it just didn't make sense to me. Well, 
<laughs> I think it was just a literary decision. I don't think yeah, she had, sure had to explain. Right. <laughs> it didn't make sense, but the author decided to do it. Otherwise, she wouldn't have a book. <laughs> she wouldn't have a book, right? <laughs> Why did she did a lot of research into um, flus and contagion and pathogens and this type of flu that she's describing, I guess technically would have um, burned itself out very rapidly and wouldn't have had the chance to spread in the way that she's describing. But I think it probably goes back to what Cece was saying earlier too. It was a, a love song to the world and she just needed so many characters and had to get rid of 99% of everybody else. <laughs> My question is why did she decide to have this, uh, the setting around the Great Lakes around, you know, in Michigan? Yeah. Because talking about so many of the towns that, you know, they traveled through, those were all ones I was familiar with. And so I just wondered what made her decide to uh, have the setting you know, in the Great Lakes region. I thought it was probably because we're the only freshwater source in the entire Northern Hemisphere. Um, so they needed fresh water, the survivors. So they all mi migrated there. It was never explained that way, mm -hmm. but I kind of guessed that was maybe why it was because, you know, all the other coasts would be salt water, not drinkable, all that kind of stuff. But we had fresh water here. Mm -hmm. They talk about that that environmentally that because of climate change, more and more people are going to be moving towards us because we are the only freshwater source in the United States and even in the Northern Hemisphere, I think. Well, not other than small lakes, obviously, but it's the biggest source, the Great Lake. Franny? I, I thought that, um, that she seemed to know Toronto very well. I mean, she she described it in great de detail, and uh, of course, if you're in Toronto, you're on a Great Lake, mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. and if people are migrating out of Toronto, uh, you know, they very very well may end up in you know other places along the lake. So I think uh, she wanted it to be to start it out in Toronto. I think and um, it did. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Where is she from? Do we know? She is from um, the Vancouver area um, and a, an island off Vancouver. And I do not know the name of it, but her experience with Toronto was when she was 15 years old. She was homeschooled, first of all. When she was 15 years old, she joined a uh, dance group where she went to Toronto to study dance. And so that would be the, uh, you know, the Toronto connection. But her other experience was in New York City. And I thought it was interesting that she said it as going around the Great Lakes too, as opposed to places that she grew up more familiar with. And, uh, but there's a couple of clues anyway. <laughs> she grew up on a small island off of Vancouver of about a thousand people. The island is supposedly the size of Manhattan. Um, so her early upbringing really reminded me of what she described for Arthur. Yeah. Uh, the island like that he lived. And Miranda. Right. And Miranda. <clears throat> Miranda. Yeah. And I mean, it was very relatable to me living here. Mm -hmm. You already talked, I know I was a little late. Have you already talked about Station 11? And what that had to do with no. everything? <laughs> Not yet, no. Not yet. What did everyone think of the comic book? Mm -hmm. I would love to have seen her drawings. <laughs> <laughs> that was an interesting subplot though. I mean, to bring that in as a, almost a parallel to what was going on with the virus too, but uh, and the fact that there were only two copies and one went to, um, what was it, Arthur's son, uh, the young boy who became the prophet of all things. And, uh, and uh, Miranda had kind of kept it pretty private. There were only 10 or 11 copies or something like that of it. Mm -hmm. Or two. Yeah. So you wonder if the author had some drawing experience in her background or what? Yeah. 
Um, I know she went to a school for the arts, but I think she she studied dance and performing arts. Yeah. Okay. So, but I wouldn't be surprised if she had. Right. Or knew of someone background. that that was the big thing. Yeah. Somebody. Maybe she was originally thinking of making this uh, whole novel a graphic novel. Graphic novel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That would be very neat. It would be a very interesting graphic novel. Yeah. Well, she wouldn't, she, um, Mandel, wouldn't have been able to do the drawing. Because she said, you know, she had said she'd love to do a graphic novel, but she can't draw. So. <laughs> I, wonder, I wondered when I read this, if we had read this, had the opportunity to read this with a group of the high school kids like we did educated, mm -hmm. it would be interesting to know what, do you know if, if any of the classes are reading this, Mary, at the high school? I know they've been given copies and I think in some of the bigger events, they've sort of been um, steered towards that. But yeah. It'd be really interesting to, to especially because we're, and they are in a pandemic and how it's impacted their life. And it'd be mm -hmm. really interesting, I think, to get um, a young adult's perspective mm -hmm. in the book. Well, I think too, and I don't know where I saw this, but I think this was written for middle school aged kids, or that's my understanding. Yeah. Um, and I, I felt like it was, and I placed myself in that category because the chapters were so short. I was like, oh, wow, this is a fun book to read because <laughs> the chapters are only one page. I think all of her, aren't all of her books that way, though? Aren't they all written? Well, they may be, but I'm just saying it, it was fun to read because yeah. you feel like you were making progress. Right, right. I, th I thought it was more geared to a younger audience, frankly, because it didn't have to explain itself in a lot of ways that I've already brought up, which yeah. I think adult people might have questioned more. It was just more of a fantasy. You right. Know? So. I know my granddaughter read it in the Shorewood school system a couple of years ago for school. So yes, mm -hmm. it, it was originally published as a, um, yeah. Oh, that's really surprising. Wow, I would not have guessed that. Yeah, so yeah. I don't know if I want my young kids to read it. But. That's why we have a pandemic, people. Yeah, not during a pandemic, but if it was before the pandemic, yes, it was probably before the pandemic. No, I'm saying that's why we have a pandemic, so kids can see that these things come alive. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that can, can be right. It kind of dovetailed nicely, didn't it? <laughs> well, it made me worry more because I sit here and, and look at the news and say, okay, death rates are still going up, even though we've got a vaccine, even though we're trying to cover up more, even though, you know, all this stuff. And now we've got like three or four new variants yes. coming. Yeah. This thing isn't over yet. You yeah. know, I oh, mean, it, 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 we better hope it doesn't turn into what this book is about. Right. Well, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. This is slightly off the subject, but unfortunately not much off the subject. I don't know if um, all of you have been vaccinated yet, but I had an appointment. It was canceled. I thought, oh, I can wait till March. That's okay. And then someone called me yesterday and said, if you've uh, been a, a, a patient of, of Mike's up at Aurora in, in uh, Fish, Sister Bay in the last two years, call there, they're taking appointments to be given at Aurora in Sturgeon Bay. And I called right away, I mean, in Green Bay, excuse me. I called right away and I have an appointment for tomorrow afternoon. Oh, well, very good. For how many, too, but how many people have been vaccinated already? Me. We have appointments. I yeah. have an appointment for Wednesday at, with public health. They canceled it. So mm -hmm. I right away tried um, Aurora, but I've never gone to my flood, so they couldn't give me an appointment. Yeah. So I'm scheduled now March 30th at Door County Medical. Oh, no. But I'm really bummed about it. It's just. I know. I haven't I seen know. my kids for over a year, and I was so excited thinking, oh, by mid March, I'll be able to see them. And <laughs> I can't how many of us have appointments? I do. Me. Mine's yeah. postponed. For my second. Mine's postponed. Really, Joan? Oh. Mm -hmm. 
Is it it through Door County Medical or is it? Yeah, yeah. It was postponed. (coughs) Well, they said canceled, but they may set up another, a later date. So I'm considering it. Right. Postponed. Several appointments. They've been canceled. I've had them with the health department. I've had them with the hospital. I've had them with the doctor's office. Canceled, canceled, canceled. So good luck. (laughs) Do they cancel like a couple days before or do you get notification longer before? Like ours are is ours are for the eleventh next week. (laughs) Depends on who you're with. Carrie, if you're with Door County Medical, I don't know what they do. Do Public health is at it all appointments. Email. Yeah, I mean, ours is through Dr. Rebhan. We're to go to the hospital at such and such a time. What time of day? One o'clock. I I I'm a little afraid that anything after like 10:30 might get canceled because they don't have the full amount of vaccines they requested. Well, at least the health department, they would put in their orders on Saturday and they'd find out Monday morning how many they'd actually gotten. And then they made, at least two weeks ago, they then made calls to everyone that they wouldn't have vaccine for. So I I think it's weekly. Yeah, and to call and, and find out where call you at, or it was an email actually sherry so at the beginning of the week but not because from door, they door called, right they called us we we came home like a week and back here a week and a half ago to help our daughter-in-law who had surgery last week so we weren't in the house five minutes when the doctor's office called and said they wanted us to come like tomorrow and so Rob said, well, can we put it off? So we have it for the 11th, but I don't want to, you know, go back up and find out. <laughs> can I clarify? Yeah. Sherry, you're with Door County Medical Center. They are not canceling appointments. In fact, I had to make one with them for March 30th. They're calling you back if you go on now. It's Door County Public Health okay. that has canceled appointments. Mm-hmm. In fact, I just got two emails this morning specifically. <laughs> Couple yesterday, but I got specifically canceling my public health appointments on this Wednesday and March 3rd. And they're going to then call you to reschedule when they know they have enough vaccines. I don't know what Maggie said, whether Door County Medical is canceling appointments, but I have not heard anybody say they have yet. There's a difference there. There's the two different right. places that are right, given. Right. That is true. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> And then have you heard that you have quite a bit of coverage after two weeks after your first shot? No. So you're pretty well protected after mm-hmm. you have shot number one and two so weeks later you're 90% protected. Who are you talking to? <laughs> I think my brother told me that. <laughs> and who, <laughs> which, uh, who is a doctor. Who is a doctor, <laughs> right. <laughs> I which think that, that which after, even after two shots you still have to keep masked up you oh of course yeah, yeah. yeah. you yeah. still and, and and two weeks after that you're still not totally you have to wait two weeks supposedly but i but. thought i read that you don't have any after your first shot anyway. well i still keep my distance and wear a mask and stay home basically so i'm you know i'm probably that'll be a hard habit to break <laughs> really? Well, of, of the people that have gotten their vaccines, which vaccine did you get? I know that Moderna. Okay, I got Moderna. I'm getting Pfizer. They did told you have me any I reaction? Did you? No, no react. Mary, did you have any? I was I was very tired the next day, but that's all. Yeah, my mom but had. And the day after, I was fine. My mom had both of them at scan. They were Pfizer. And the only uh, side effect she had was a sore arm. She was fine with both of them. So good for her. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I, I want to be her when I grow up. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, they were the first ones to get it. And I think Pfizer is, I mean, I think public health is Pfizer and Door County Medical is Moderna. Yes. Yeah. I'm getting Moderna. Mm-hmm. 
and Aurora is Pfizer. Pfizer, okay, got it. I wonder if Prevea in Green Bay is giving out shots. I have been to one of their clinics, no doctors. <laughs> oh, I well. think they are. Sure. Yeah, I'll have to make oh, a phone call. My son-in-law got his second one now, and he, he's a doctor, and he got it at St. Mary's in Green Bay. Ah, I'm going there Wednesday for something else. I wonder if I could get, I'll have to. <laughs> okay. Hey, one thing I, last time we talked about each of us listing our favorite books in different categories. Did anybody else do that? Or what, did I just I end up? I forgot about it. Well, <laughs> I forget everything. I hope you love me anyway, but I tell <laughs> you, I forgot to read this book. And then yesterday I hurried up and went and got it from the library. And oh. I thank God I'm a fast reader because I, I read about three quarters of it. When I realized I wasn't going to be able to totally finish it unless I stayed up all night. I decided I would skip along. So I read various pages, you know, like I would skip 15 pages and then go on. So I've read most of it. I'm sure I've missed at least a quarter. <laughs> when, you, when you read intensively like that, I think you, sometimes you get more out of it and sometimes you get less. So I can't tell you which I got. <laughs> well, tell us which books you listed. Oh, I don't want to be the only one. Oh, they Carol, <laughs> maybe it'll well, inspire you, us. You can, we all right. forgot. Oh, I'm probably typical of, of a lot of people. I have nothing unusual for like pop popular fiction. And these are books that I've read more than once. That's how I I um, rate which books I I really love is I, if I can read them more than once and sometimes three times, you never know. But my two favorite popular fictions were Prince of Tides by Pat Conroy, which I think I mentioned. And Lonesome Dove by Larry McMurdy. Mm -hmm. And then True Crime, True Crime, Fatal Vision by Joe McInnes, which is about, well, it's anyway, it's a wonder, it's an amazing gripping uh, dissection of a horrible murder. Um, and, and um, you know, finding the person, I mean, finally getting him into jail. Uh, classic East of Edom by John Steinbeck, mm -hmm. a classic tale of good and evil. I mean, just really good. And historic, I don't know, Winds of War and War and Remembrance by Herman Walk. Yeah, great books. Yeah. So yeah. those are my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> that I've read all of them more than once, <laughs> sometimes yeah. three times. And they're long. Who ones. are the authors of those two again? Which two? Uh, uh, Winds of War and War and Remembrance. Herman Walk. W. -O oh yeah. Okay. Okay. W O U K. W O U K. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think they made a TV mini series out of them too. It way back. Sure. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So anybody else did it then? I was the only one. <laughs> I forgot all about it. Oh gosh, so sorry. Yeah. You've inspired us. <laughs> a heck with you guys. <laughs> it wasn't there was, written. There I was, was, I was so anxious to hear all your favorites so I could put them on my list. <laughs> <laughs> you probably read them all. <laughs> so my daughter in California wanted to read a biography of Lincoln, and I suggested Team of Rivals. Yeah. Yes. That's any other suggestions for her? That's a that's yeah. almost a thousand pages. I know, but it was oh, wonderful. It was so good. So good. Mm, okay, I'll write that one down. <laughs> it's a real uh, poem, but it's really it's worth it in the end. If you haven't read Obama's new book, it's it's beautifully written. And uh, yes, I loved okay. it. Is it I enjoyed that Michelle? tremendously too. Is it better than Michelle's? <laughs> <laughs> they dovetail. They're they both do. very good. <laughs> I, I'm really glad that I read Michelle's first. Oh, me too. Oh, yeah. really? Okay. Yeah, I read hers. So that I'll have to. Well, I already read the next four books for book club. So I'm going to have to go back and like reread them when we meet again. <laughs> what is our next one? Uh, Survivor is it called? Uh, the Survivors by the Adam, Survivors. Adam Frankel. Mm -hmm. Adam Frankel, yeah. Oh, good. And do Was we have it? a leader for that one yet? I don't have anything noted. 
discussed at that one. I enjoyed the salt path. I'll talk about that one if we don't really leave you for that one. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I, I suggested that, Carol. We could be co-leaders for that one. Oh, okay. One. I didn't know you were already on there, Peggy. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I probably enjoyed it because I love England and my mom's from England and all that stuff, you know. But I did enjoy that story greatly and the characters and the writing and everything. But that's another time. <laughs> Listening to Alan Kapishki the other day talking about the arts, and of course, I had the original schedule that had it an hour later than it actually happened. Uh, the, the importance of the arts to sustain us um, as part of the big read. Um, he said that the, um, the audio edition of Station Eleven was just one of the best audio books mm -hmm. he's ever listened to. Did any, it, he loved the reader and did really? anyone listen to it mm. instead of read the book? I've listened to it and the reader is very good. Um, she takes her time and she pauses when she needs to pause. And I can see why Ellen would have liked the, the reader a lot. She's very good. Um, and I read most of them on the Audible books, and some readers just kind of turn you off. Some really get you excited about what they're doing. I think she's very good at uh, getting you to uh, read a long book, even though some of the chapters are short. Um, she's kind of an inspiring reader. Would you get that um, through the library or through Audible or how do you, how did you I, get that? I generally get it through the library. I mean, through Audible. I don't know about, um, about the library, what yeah. they have. Uh, I've never been able to quite figure out the website to get on it. <laughs> but that's okay. just me. Yeah, I don't like that. Thank you. I wrote an article in the Time Magazine a couple of weeks about the 100 must-read books of 2020. I mean, there's just 100 of them. <laughs> wow. but, um, if we need any future recommendations, there's probably some good ones there. Do you have it right there with you? What are the top, like, five? <laughs> well, they're all divided by uh, fiction, you know, best fiction, best nonfiction, but of fiction, 10 best fiction. Actress by Anne Enright. At, oh, they're all listed alphabetically, so it must oh. be best. <laughs> so are they all new books? I assume they... so. Yeah, I think they're all new books. 2020. 100 must read books of 2020, right? Who puts out that list? It was in Time Magazine. Time Magazine, uh, okay. I know, a couple of weeks ago, but yeah, they're November 30th, December 7th issue. Okay. Hmm. That's great, but the library won't have a lot of those books yet, so. Probably not, right, yeah, but it's it's like six pages long of all different, you know, poetry. Yeah, fields. And best nonfiction and fiction and all that kind of stuff, so. <clears throat> So I was very excited to hear that our wonderful poet who read her beautiful poem at the inauguration is going to read a poem at the Super Bowl. Yep. Yeah, really. I saw that yeah. too, right? Yeah. I, I said to my husband, finally, I'll be interested in watching the Super Bowl. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> is she writing it too for Super Bowl? Yes. Of course she is. I think it was her first poem. I can't remember if, if she's writing this specifically for that or if it's one of her original poems. I don't know. I, found, I was so enthralled with her. So I went, you know, I don't know if it was on Google or anyway, I, I guess I Googled her name and there was a reciting that she was doing and it was like from three years ago. And you know how she talked about, she was just able recently in the last couple of years to overcome her uh, speech impediment and to go back and listen to this it was so amazing because she, you could hear, you know, that how she could not pronounce the R sound. And as she was very humorous, it was just great. I don't know uh, if I'd be able to find it again, but she's just, she's just wonderful. Um, there is. 
she talked about how she had gone, the whole thing was about, I don't know if maybe it was even a TED talk, that she had gone to audition to play the part of Nalia in the, um, in the Lion King and how her mother was pushing her to do this. And, you know, the fact that she was so little and looked like a nine-year-old or a 12-year-old that she would always continue to be a nine-year-old or 12-year-old. And so they wouldn't have to find another person. And of course, it goes on and on how she didn't get the part, but that inspired her to keep going, you know, with her poetry. Um, but it was, it was really fun to learn more about her. She's just a mm -hmm. great girl. A lot of you- I think I think she told that story on the moth. It is, yes, the moth. Okay. It, that's what it was, the moth. It was okay. wonderfully done. I just finished this book. Oh, ah. This I love Fareed. I think he's great. Is that good? It was really interesting. Okay. What's the title, Maggie? We couldn't see the it. Ten, ten Lessons for a Post-Pandemic World. Oh. I watch him whenever he's on. He's really good. I saw an interview um, on the Trevor Noah show with Amanda Gorman. I was watching that on YouTube last night. And once you go on something to find out about her or to hear her speak or to listen to a reading, all these other things mm -hmm. pop up. So there, mm -hmm. there's... there's She's, she's, a, she's a big seller these days. Deservedly. Yeah, it'll be mm -hmm. fun to watch her career. Uh, well, I, I couldn't find any of her poetry published. I mean, I, oh. I couldn't find anything from in the library anyway. Um, do, you, do you know if she's published? Yes. Two yes. books. Two books? Isn't she writing a children's book or? Yes. Children's book of poems? Mm -hmm. Yes. They're number one and number two sellers on Amazon right now. Wow. <laughs> Not surprisingly. Right. <laughs> like these three cat owners here, plus myself. <laughs> My former cat owner. Oh, there you go. Okay. Mm, Mine's me too. over here, so <laughs> I have to wake her up. <laughs> My cat cannot resist Zoom. Really? Yeah, that's fun. <laughs> that's, that's who our dog is. In fact, I call her Zoomy now. She <laughs> <laughs> is right there. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I think we to hear your voice. people's voices in our homes. And yeah. so... I'll just say to her, I'm going downstairs to Zoom, and boom, she's. <laughs> <laughs> she needs companionship too. She needs to hear more That's people. Right. I, we, we're getting really bored with just the two of us. So, <laughs> <laughs> what would we do without our animals during That's this pandemic? Oh, they oh, a lot. <laughs> I enjoy watching the the. Um, uh, the news hour, uh, the Zoom version, uh, where Lisa De Desjardins, the, the correspondent, uh, is at home and you see her cat all the time. In the <laughs> and you always wonder, where's that cat going to be this time? <laughs> or like Lara on uh, Good Morning America with her dog that's always licking her hand and <laughs> to do the news, yeah. One of many dogs. Yeah. Mary, are you? Do you have copies of the book for our next month? I have copies on order right now. They're not in the library yet, though. Okay, so Perfect. you'll let us know when they're in. Absolutely. Yep. And I should just let everyone know um, we're only scheduled for another three more minutes. So just in case there's anything oh. um, anyone wants to say before we run out of time, it was nice seeing you all. It was, yeah, it was great. Yeah. Hope we will get our vaccination soon. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. We have much to report. Hopefully. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And lots more events coming up in the next few weeks for Station 11. So look for those. Okay. Thank you all for reading it. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.